Hmm. I guess someone had to talk about this IV fluids. Let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's medical review series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we we'll look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at a very, very important topic, adult fluid management. I want you to pay so much attention to this topic because as a final year student, as a fifth year student, as an intern, IV fluids are always given on a daily basis. We get cases where Patients are overloaded with fluids or patients are not given enough fluids. IV fluids are very, very important. And that's why I decided why not teach on this, especially in emergency medicine, because this information will be very valuable to you as a final year student. And even after you've graduated, you will be able to use this information when you're starting your junior residency. So let's jump right in. So remember that IV fluids are pretty much one of the most common and universal interventions in medicine. They are predominantly two main types of IV fluids, which we'll talk about in detail a bit later on in this lecture. You have the crystalloids, which are pretty much solutions that are frequently used as our first choice. And we have colloids, which are alternatives to crystalloids with um, highly variable use depending on the indication that you have. Now, remember that errors do occur when prescribing these IV fluids. Electrolytes, fluid amounts can be given in erroneous manners. When you're talking about the emergency department, when you're talking about the acute admission units, when you're talking about the general wards, even the surgical wards. It's, it's less common in operation theaters because they're a bit more strict with that. And even in critical care units, they're a bit more strict with that. But on the other areas, there are a lot of area, errors rather that happen when prescribing IV fluids. That's why it's very, very important as a junior medical staff to have a good understanding about IV fluids. Now, you really need to note that this lecture will not be exhaustful and I'll leave out a lot of the basic principles. So some of the basic principles, I already assume that you already know, because if I was to add everything to this lecture, this lecture would take a very long time. So I want to keep this as brief as possible and as easy to understand. So I will take my time on this lecture. So the basic physiology that you really need to understand when it comes to prescribing fluids is remember that the body is made up of 50 to 70 percent water where you have infants having a much higher percentage about 70 percent older individuals and those that are obese having a much lower percentage of total body water that's about 50 percent with an average of 60 percent so you each and every one of us has roughly about 60 percent of total body water now this total body water is predominantly divided into two compartments an intracellular compartment, which makes up two thirds, two over three of the total body water, and an extracellular compartment, which makes up one third. The extracellular compartment can be divided into the interstitium, which are pretty much water that's in between the cells, which is accounting for three over four, three quarters of the extracellular fluid, and the plasma, which con consists of a, a quarter of the extracellular fluid. This is what predominantly makes the fluid component of blood. Now, Remember that water is going to be moving across these membranes that separate these compartments via osmot and to maintain osmotic equilibrium. So there are some forces that are pretty much going to be driving this water. Think of the two important forces, the hydrostatic pressure and the osmotic pressure. I already explained these concepts in another video. If you have been following my channels, I've been explaining this concept of hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. Just to remind you, remember if you have any fluid contained in anything 
the particles of that fluid are going to be colliding with the walls of the container and creating a pressure on the walls of the container. The pressure that is created by that substance that's contained in a, in a compartment is referred to as a hydrostatic pressure. Blood is contained in blood vessels. It will exert a certain pressure on blood vessels and this will force fluid out of the vascular space. And of course, this hydrostatic pressure tends to push fluid out of the vascular space. The opposing force to this is an osmotic pressure which tends to pull fluid back into the vascular space. You have a special type of osmotic pressure, which is referred to as colloidal pressure or oncotic pressure, which is offered predominantly by the plasma proteins that we have. Now remember that in most of the cells, you have the sodium potassium ATPase pumps, which are pretty much going to be pumping out three sodium ions for two potassium ions. And these normally are going to be ensuring that the potassium concentration within the cells is much higher than outside the cells. And the sodium concentration is much higher on the outside than it is on the inside. And remember, wherever sodium goes, that's where water is going to follow. So there are some mechanisms that are pretty much going to be coming into play to maintain a strict fluid and electrolyte balance in the body. And watch this video to the end because the juicy information actually comes in the later thirds of this video. Subscribe if you haven't. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment. So here's a schematic to help you understand how important these IV fluids are. So you have a 70 kg man. And we say that the total body water is 60% of the 70 kg. So in essence, we are having roughly around 42 liters of water. Now, this 42 liters is divided across two compartments, the extracellular compartment, which accounts for one third, and an intracellular compartment, which accounts for two thirds. So the ECF is going to be about 14 liters. The ICF is going to be about 28 liters. The ECF is going to be divided into an interstitium, which accounts for three quarters. So three quarters of 14 is 10.5 liters. 0 0.5 of this is actually transcellular fluid. Then, of course, a quarter of this 14 is going to be 3.5, which is going to be plasma the fluid component of blood. Now, the separation between the ICF and the ECF is going to be offered by the cell membrane. The separation between the interstitium and the plasma is going to be offered by the capillary membrane. Of course, there are hydrostatic pressure and oncotic as well as osmotic pressures that occur across these demarcations. So I just want you to keep this in mind. This is just basic principles that you've already learned in physiology, so I'm not going to spend so much time on them. Then there is... Um, a concept of osmolarity and osmolality. Now, osmolality is pretty much the amount of solute dissolved in a solvent like water measured in the kilograms of that solvent, per kilogram of the solvent. Then osmolarity is pretty much the amount of solute that is dissolved in a solvent like water measured in a volume. So it's per liter of the solution. So the normal osmolality of um, plasma is roughly around 280 to 295. What, do, what does this mean? If there are more electrolytes in plasma than there is the water component, the osmolality is going to increase. If there's less electrolytes and more water, then the osmolarity is going to reduce. So that's the concept of increase and decrease in osmolarity. And remember, when the osmolarity increases, you stimulate processes that are going to retain water. When the osmolarity decreases, you stimulate processes that are going to get rid of that water. And of course, the main cation in plasma is sodium. The main ion ions in plasma are chloride and bicarbonate. So in a normal state, the plasma electrolytes actually are going to be accounting for the majority of this plasma osmolality. And there's a good correlation between the plasma osmolality and the sodium concentration. So a high plasma sodium concentration is going to mean that these, it's hyperosmolar. Then a low plasma concentration is hyposmolar. And I've already explained the concept of hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure. Now remember that fluids are normally going to be gained and lost from a person. The gains are pretty much due to the food that we take, the drinks that we take, and a small amount, about 200 to 300 mils of fluid actually comes from carbohydrate metabolism. Because remember, when you metabolize carbohydrates, you're going to give off water. Then of course, the fluid is going to be lost via the urine, the sweat, the feces. It's also lost through other things that we have pretty much no control over. Those, those are known as insensible losses. Every time you breathe out, you're going to be losing a little bit of some fluid. Every time you perspirate, every time you sweat, you're going to be losing a bit of fluid in the skin. 
So I hope you're, you're following this lecture and you're following everything, every step as I go. Because this is very, very important for you to know. So here, here is the demarcation between the fluid gains and the fluid losses. So aura fluids was supposed to take in about 1.5 liters, so 1,500 mils. Water in the food is going to be about 1,000. Water from oxidation is about 300, so we should take in about 2,800 total. Now water that's lost from the urine is about 1,500, from the stool about 300, from the lungs about 500, from the skin about 500. And remember that loss of water from the lungs and the skin is dependent on the situation that is there. For example, on a hot day, you're going to sweat more often, so you're going to lose more than the 500. The opposite happens on a cold day. If someone is having a high respiratory rate, like acute respiratory distress, then they're going to lose more water from the body because the lungs are going to be pushing out a lot of uh, carbon dioxide, and this carbon dioxide is going to be moving out with some water vapor. In essence, we're supposed to lose about 2,800 mils, so there should be a balance between the amount of water we gain versus the amount of water that we lose. Okay, I hope that really makes sense. And, and now you even get to understand why we have our maintenance fluid roughly around 2.5 liters to about 3 liters, because that's already covering the amount. If, if we assume that someone is not taking any of these things, not taking anything in my mouth, they should at least have 2.5 liters to about 3 liters of water to cover this input of water in the body. Or fluid in the body. Then you have some electrolytes that are very important. Sodium in the plasma is about 135 to 145. So in the ECF and then in the ICF it's 14. Uh, potassium 3.5 to 5.0. Some people even go 3.5 to 4.5. Then intracellular 140 to 150. And then chloride 95 to 105 in the um, ECF. And then in the ICF it's 4. Uh, bicarbonate is 25, and then in the ICF, it's 12. Okay, the, these are the most four important electrolyte concentrations that I want you to know, not just as a student, even when you're prescribing the fluids as an intern. Now, remember that in healthy individuals, the volume is pretty much going to be controlled by the osmoreceptors, the baroreceptors, and the renin angiotensin aldosterone and ADH axis, of which I explained when we talked about hypertension on the channel, which I explained when we talked about heart failure. I don't know if I've talked about heart failure on the channel, but if we haven't, just drop a comment and we will talk about heart failure on the channel as well. So now these mechanisms are going to be working to some extent. Now, they may not work well after injury, like after trauma, after surgery, they may not compensate for the loss. They may or not even compensate in episodes of sepsis or any other critical illness. Now, what are some of the indications of intravenous fluid? We're now done with the basics that I presume you should have already known. Now, what are the indications of IV fluids? So we use IV fluids to maintain homeostasis, which is the maintenance of a constant internal environment. When someone is not taking oral um, intake that is sufficient enough, for example, in patients that are kept no per oral, it could be patients that are going for surgery. Then we also use this to replace the insensible losses during a fever. Remember that the body temperature is higher, more sweating, more water loss. Then of course, after suffering burns because the barrier to the skin is actually impaired. And it could also be to replace losses from the GIT as manifested by vomiting, diarrhea, or even fistulas, or even the urinary tract in cases of diabetes insipidus blood loss in cases of trauma or surgery, and even third spacing. I'll talk about third spacing very shortly. Then, of course, it can be used in preoperative resuscitation before emergency surgery and elective surgery. And what you really need to note is that this lecture is giving you the baseline, the stepping stone. There are many different conditions where we give IV fluids in a different way. So this is just to get you started. And then, of course, we will discuss those different conditions on the channel eventually. But I want you to remember the five R's when it comes to fluids in, uh, indications. Resuscitation, routine maintenance, replacement, redistribution, and reassessment. The, I think the, four, the first four are the ones that we actually give fluids and then we reassess. So I want you to remember these five R's. This is very, very important for you to know. Resuscitation, routine maintenance, replacement, 
and redistribution, and then you reassess after that. So what is third spacing? So this is just pretty much fluid that's going to be accumulating in spaces that normally contain minimal amounts of fluid. So it could be in the peritoneal cavity, it could be in the pleural cavity, for example, during surgery, during anesthesia, or even during some inflammatory conditions like sepsis. Now, this is going to be caused by vasodilatation and leakage of the vascular epithelium. And of course, the, this breakdown of normal compartmental integrity can actually result in loss of uh, circulating intravascular volume. So the fluid is not really in the vascular space. That's where it's needed. It's not in the vascular space. It's trapped in these so-called potential spaces. Now, remember that it is actually possible for someone to have edema and still be dehydrated. By virtue of them having edema, remember that the fluid is not in the vascular space where it's needed. It's trapped in the interstitium. So it's possible for someone to be edematous and still be dehydrated. Do not have that knee-jerk response that say that if this person has edema, there's no chance of them being dehydrated. They can still be dehydrated. So what are the, some of the daily requirements? So if a person is not eating, no drinking, they, need, they require roughly about 2.5 to 3 liters of water, 100 millimoles of sodium, 60 millimoles of potassium, 5 millimoles of calcium, and 1 millimole of magnesium. These are the daily requirements for someone that's not eating, for someone that's not drinking. And how do we assess these fluid requirements? Of course, we take a history. This will give us a clue of the expected fluid status. For example, if someone is involved in a road traffic accident, we know that they are going to lose certain amounts of fluids. Certain amounts of fractures or certain fractures will denote certain amounts of fluid loss with, of course, the pelvic fractures being um, the ones that lose a lot of blood and they can actually have the risk of dying. Then we also look for causes of dehydration, like, for example, preoperative fasting, ongoing GIT illnesses, self-neglected uh, following an acute confusional state. Then, of course, some medications that may be given that may actually alter the fluid distribution of the patient or make the patient more susceptible to adverse effects from fluid therapy. For example, if you're giving them diuretics, there will be some fluid and electrolyte imbalance that you may create in patients that have heart failure. You want to give fluids with caution because you don't want to overload them with fluid. Even in patients with renal failure, you don't want to overload them with fluids. And of course, when you perform your physical examination, there should be some signs of dehydration that you may elicit. Things like thirst, reduced skin turgor or elasticity, decreased mucous membranes, and increase in capillary refill time. Remember that the capillary refill time should be less than three seconds. The patient may actually be hypotensive. That's a systolic blood pressure less than 90. And a diastolic blood pressure less than 60. The patient may actually even be in shock. Now, remember that... Um, in individuals that have lost some amount of fluid, there are going to be some compensatory mechanisms that are pretty much going to be working to raise the cardiac output, to raise the blood pressure, therefore maintaining the tissue oxygenation. So it's not surprising that the patient is actually going to be tachycardic and hypotensive. It's not surprising. The BP is only going to fall after someone has lost 20 to 30% of the intravascular volume. So if the BP falls, know that they have lost 20 to 30 of their intravascular volume. The pulse may be rapid and thready. Sometimes you may not even be able to palpate it. The urine will be concentrated and there'll be a decrease in the urine output. Remember that the normal urine output is about 0.5 to 1 mL per kg per hour. So we'll use one for easy calculation. Suppose someone is weighing 100 kg. So it means that in one hour, this person should have produced 100 mL. So if you really want to have a strict input-output for this patient, we will ensure that this patient is catheterized and you monitor the urine bag. So after one hour, this patient, assuming that they are weighing 100 kg, they are supposed to have produced 100 mils or at least 500 to uh, 50 rather, not 550 to 100 mils. So if they have less than 50 mils, it means that this person is not producing enough urine. Now, in most cases, we're supposed to match the urine output to the urine input, uh, to the fluid input. I don't know who would drink urine. Sorry about that. And all outputs must actually be considered. What do I mean? You should look at the amount of urine that has passed. If they have any drains, abdominal drains, you should add that to the output. If there's a stoma, you should add that to the output. If there's an NGT aspiration, add that to the output. As well as consider also the insensible losses. You can estimate the insensible losses. And 
always evaluate the signs and symptoms as a whole. Don't just pick one thing and say, okay, this person has reduced skin tagger, therefore they are dehydrated, therefore they need IV fluids. That's not how it works. Put all these signs. There should be a constellation of signs and symptoms together for you to tell that this person actually is in shock. This person actually needs IV fluids. This person needs to be resuscitated. This patient is okay. Do not pick tachycardia out of context. The tachycardia may be caused by something else. There are some special considerations when you're giving IV fluids. Number one, patients with major burns, there's a way in which we calculate using our parkland formula where the volume of fluid that we give is equal to 4 mils multiplied the, by the percentage surface area multiplied by the um, body weight of the patient. Then, of course, there's a way in which these fluids are given. In traumatic brain injury, the fluid is adjusted according to the main arterial pressure to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure. Because remember that cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to the main arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure. Then in trauma or septic uh, peritonitis patients, these may actually require much larger amounts of fluids. Like I say, these are specific conditions which we will cover later on. In patients that have heart failure, renal impairment, or even apparent respiratory failure, you give fluids with caution. I already mentioned that earlier on. Now, how do we measure that the fluids that we're giving are working? The patients should improve clinically. That's the first and foremost thing. Their urine output should improve. Their capillary refill time should reduce. Their heart rate should reduce. And of course, weighing the patient is the simplest way to actually, and the most reliable way as a means of monitoring the fluid status. It's not going to tell you where the fluid is, whether it's in the vascular space or it's in the interstitium. It will just simply tell you that this person has lost this fluid. This person has gained this fluid. And of course, the biochemical signs are going to be denoted by a normalization in the sodium, urea, creatinine. So pretty much the electrolytes, urea, and creatinine will normalize. And the patient subjectively, subjectively rather, feels much better and they're no longer thirsty. Remember that thirst is pretty much a very late sign of dehydration. Now, these findings may be absent if they are masked by other factors. For example, urine output may remain low for about 24 hours after surgery as part of the normal response to injury, uh, despite adequately giving this person IV fluids. And of course, the urine output can also be affected by diuretics. So you have to Factor all those things when you're assessing this patient and see if whatever you're doing is a success or not. Now, the investigations that we want to order, of course, your urea, electrolytes, creatinine, and your uh, arterial blood gases, ABGs. Then, of course, you're, you're going to have a raised plasma urea that's above 6. Sodium levels may be above 145. This can indicate dehydration. In acidosis, you may get a pH that's less than 7.35. Remember that the normal pH of blood is 7.35 to 7.45. So these are just some of the few investigations that you can actually order to assess the fluid status or the acid base balance and fluid electrolyte balance of the patient. Now, here's one important thing before we actually go into how much fluids you can actually give. This calculation confuses many people. Now here we want to calculate the number of the drop rate of IV fluids. Okay. How many drops are you going to give so that you ensure that this amount of fluid is given in such and such a time? Suppose I say give 500 mils of this normal cell line in 15 minutes. How am I going to do this? How many drops are going to be running for it to be given in 15 minutes? Now, depending on whichever drip set you're using, the standard drip set is going to give you for one mil, okay? 16 drops gives you one mil. When you have 16 drops, you have given one mil of the fluid. For the micro drip, if you have one mil, it will give you 60 drops. So 60 drops give you one mil. So it means that it, it's much slower than the universal one. So our drop rate per minute is going to be equal to the quantity of fluid required in liters per day. Multiply that by 10. Okay, so if 2.5 liters is needed per day, we're going to say 2.5 multiplied by 10. 2.5 liters. Remember, this is in liters, not in mils, because if you put it in mils, it's going to give you a very, very large number, and you'll be confused. So 2.5 liters multiplied by 10. So it means that this should be running at 25 drops per minute. Then the number of drops per minute, so that's your drop rate. The number of drops per minute can also be calculated using the fluid in mils that you're supposed to push in, divided by 4. 
Okay, this is per hour. So if you if a hundred mils per hour, it means that you're going to be giving twenty five drops per minute. So if you divide a hundred divided by four, that gives you twenty five drops per minute. Then of course the number of micro drops per minute is the volume in mils divided by an hour. So fifty micro drops is going to be fifty mils per hour. I hope this helps with your drop factor. I think this this one here at most is the, the one that is going to be you can actually use. Of course, you would have to um, scale it down depending on how now you want to give it in 15 minutes and all that. Okay, you may change the factor, the division factor. But I just want you to keep this formula in mind. If you are actually to take a screenshot of this, take a screenshot of this. It may help you. What are the types of fluids that we give? They are crystalloids and they are colloids. So crystalloids can be either isotonic, meaning that they have the same osmolarity as plasma. Hypertonic, meaning that they have a higher osmolarity than plasma. Hypotonic, a lower osmolarity than plasma. So the isotonic fluids include 0.9% normal saline or normal saline, whatever you want to call it. Dextrose 5% in water, you know, D5W. Ringer's lactate, which is sodium lactate, Hatman solution. And the hypertonic fluids, 5% dextrose in a quarter strength, normal saline, quarter strength, so 0. Point, or half strength rather. Is this a quarter or a half? 0. 0.45 is half, right? So it's half strength, not a quarter. 0.45% of normal saline. Then of course, dextrose 5% in normal saline. And then hypotonic fluids, 0.33% in normal saline. I doubt you ever, you've ever seen hypotonic fluids being used in, in your setting up to now. The most common things that you have seen being used is normal saline, dextrose 5% in water, Ringer's lactate, or Hartman solution. Of course, you have seen blood being given. Then the colloids can either be natural, blood or albumin, or synthetic. It may be gelatin-based infusions. Now, what you really need to recall is that potassium can actually be added to normal saline and dextrose saline in the form of potassium chloride. Like, for example, in patients that we manage for diabetic ketoacidosis, we should give a certain amount of potassium chloride after we give a certain amount of fluids, of which we will cover on this channel. And I think I did cover this on the channel with diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, here is a very, very bulky table. I will not go into details of this table because I will un unnecessarily prolong this lecture. But here's, let me just guide you on how to use this table. You can actually get a screenshot of this. So here you have plasma, the concentration of the different things, of the different components. Sodium chloride, sodium chloride with 4% glucose, that's sodium chloride 0.18%. Then um, 0.45 uh, sodium chloride with 4% glucose, 5%, and so on and so forth. So this is just simply the concentrations to just give you a perspective of what you're giving in that fluid and what is contained in that fluid. Just have have some time to have a look at this thing and familiarize yourself with this diagram on the screen. Now, remember the five R's. This is where the most important part of the lecture is. The five R's, resuscitation, routine maintenance, replacement, redistribution, and reassessment. Remember these five R's, very, very important. We'll start with resuscitation. So if a patient actually requires resuscitation, we usually start off with our crystalloids. And this crystalloids, we ensure that the crystalloid we're given should have the concentration of sodium between 130 to 154 mils or millimoles per liter. So if you look at the, the diagram before that I flashed on the screen, it could be either normal saline, Ringer's lactate, Hartman solution, or plasma or blood. So we're going to be giving, if they are requiring resuscitation, we give a bolus of 500 mils of this solution over 15 minutes. Generally, we, we don't want to exceed this boluses, we don't want to exceed three liters because we'll be overloading this patient. Now, remember, patients that are coming in shock can be classified, especially with hypovolemic shock, can be classified into class one, class two, class three, class four. If they are class one or class two, they should receive an initial two liter bolus. Okay, you shouldn't go beyond that. If they're class three and class four, in addition to this bolus, they should also receive colloid, so they should receive blood. Now, recall the three to one rule of resuscitation. For every one mil of blood that you lose, you should replace it with three mils of crystalloid. So if someone has, re has lost 10 mils of blood, they should receive 30 mils of crystalloid fluid. 
that's the three to one rule. And that's with resuscitation. This is the benchmark where you're going to be starting off when you're resuscitating the patient. I will show you an algorithm at the end of this lecture to help you put everything into perspective. Then what about routine maintenance? So if the patient actually needs IV fluid for just routine maintenance to just keep them as maintenance fluid, we usually restrict it to about 25 to 30 mils per kg per day. For argument's sake, let's say a patient weighs 100 kg and we're using 30 mils per kg. So 30 multiplied by 100, that would give us 3,000. So they should receive 3,000 mils per day. So that's where we get the normal range of 2.5 to 3 liters per day as maintenance fluid. Now, approximately one millimol per kg per day of this should be potassium, sodium, and chloride. Then glucose should be given if they are starving to prevent ketosis, about 50 to 100 grams per day of glucose. Now, if the patient is actually obese, we want to use um, to adjust the IV fluids to their ideal body weight, and we want to use lower ranges of fluids per volume. So rarely should we exceed three liters if we're giving fluids as maintenance. In older patients, in patients with renal failure, in patients with cardiac failure, in malnourished patients, in malnutrition is also another different thing where we give different types of fluids depending on the situation that's there. I also covered malnutrition on the channel. We give 20 to 25 mils per kg. So again, if someone is weighing 100 kg, so it means that we would give roughly around 2,000 to 2,500 mils of fluid per day. Now, when we're prescribing these routine maintenance fluid, we should consider using 25 to 30 mils per kg per day of sodium chloride, 0.18% in 4% glucose with 27 millimoles of potassium on day one. Other alternatives actually exist. So there are other ways in which you can give this maintenance fluid. Depending on whether this person is eating or not, you may actually combine the fluids. Most of the times, if the patient is not eating, then we can give normal saline with something that has dextrose in it. Or if they are hypertensive, we want to avoid normal saline and want to give Ringer's lactate, which is one thing that I forgot to mention on the previous slide here. Avoid the normal saline in hypertensive patients. Give Ringer's lactate instead because uh, the normal saline will raise the BP of the patient and may result in other complications. So we can combine Ringer's lactate and normal saline in some cases. We can combine Ringer's lactate with dextrose in some cases. We may combine a normal saline with dextrose in some cases. And in some cases, we do encourage the patients to take oral fluids and we must aim not to exceed 30 mils per kg per day as maintenance fluid. Remember that this maintenance is also going to be covering for the insensible losses that are there. Then, of course, with replacement and redistribution, we can adjust the IV pres prescription to add and either subtract the maintenance fluid um, to account for any existing fluid loss or any electrolyte deficiencies, any excess uh, or ongoing losses or, abnorm or abnormal distributions. So in different conditions, they have different requirements of fluids. And we will cover those different conditions. Some we have already covered on the channel, some we will cover on the channel. So here are the different losses that we have of the electrolytes based on different aspects. So we have vomiting over there, biliary uh, loss over there, diarrhea and colostomies, and so on and so forth. So this is just simply a diagram showing you the ongoing losses and how much you actually lose. Familiarize yourself again with this diagram. It's very important for you to know. Here is the last slide to summarize. I don't know if this is the last slide, but I presume this is the last slide. To summarize everything I've been talking about when it comes to IV fluids, especially in adults. This is the algorithm that I want you to keep in mind. So first of all, the patient will come in. You assess, you do your ABCDE approach, your airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. Then, of course, if the patient is hypovolemic and needs resuscitation, we use the resuscitation algorithm, which is part two. If they don't, then we put them on routine maintenance. In some cases, if they have some existing conditions, we may replace, we may give this fluid replacement and redistribution to replace the ongoing losses and the redistribution of the fluids due to certain conditions. So what are the things that we're going to be looking at? We're going to be looking at pretty much things like their BP, if their systolic blood pressure is less than 100 or 90, 
their heart rate if it's greater than 90, capillary refill time is greater than 2 seconds, the peripheries are cold to touch, their respiratory rate is greater than 20 breaths per minute, and then of course all these things are suggestive that they need fluid resuscitation. So if they need fluid resuscitation, then identify the cause of them coming in in dehydration, address the cause. Give them a bolus of 500 mils of crystalloid, pretty much normal saline or Ringer's lactate over 15 minutes, reassess the patient. So reassessment is very important. If you reassess the patient and the patient still needs resuscitation, then have you given more than two liters? If you have given more than two liters, then of course this patient may need other things. They may need colloid, they may need blood transfusion. If you haven't, then you can give a further bolus of 250 to about 500 mils of crystalloid. Now, if you reassess the patient and they're not in shock, and um, if this patient is not in shock, then you go back and you actually take your history, you examine the patient, you order for other investigations and other uh, things to ascertain the cause of this. So once you now order for these other investigations to ascertain the cause of this, then can the patient actually meet the fluid and electrolyte needs orally or enterally? If they can, then of course allow them to take orally. If they can't, then ask yourself, does the patient have complex fluid or electrolyte replacement or abnormality distribution issues? Do they have any other underlying conditions that are there? Things like diabetes, things like the losses of fluid that we talked about in the previous image or that I showed you on the previous image. If those are, it now depends on the actual condition that is there. Now, if they do not have this, then you put them on maintenance fluid. So which is pretty much your 25 to 30 um, mils per kg per day. If they are frail and old, 20 to about 25 mils per kg per day. Then, of course, you reassess and you monitor your patient. We stop the IV fluids when they no longer need them. And, of course, we should take into account the NGT, the drains that are there, and the urinary catheter. The goal with fluid management is we want to aim to equal the fluid input with the fluid output. I really hope that made sense and actually shed some light on fluid management, especially in adults and the next time the child on the wards, you will know exactly what to do and you will have an idea of where to start to balance this patient's fluid and electrolyte status. If you enjoy this video, please drop a like, drop a comment, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, tell a friend to tell a friend that we are covering more topics on this channel to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.